Okay, everyone. Okay, MEWX 2016. We have uh, Tony Wyatt, Amiga OS4 developer, is going to be talking to us about next generation file systems with an S, which you can drop, and, and call it NGFS, which is the uh, file system he's been developing to allow Amiga OS to move into the future. Uh, this would be a replacement for fast file system on the Amiga OS4 platform. Tony is the developer. He's here with us. So if you're interested in that sort of thing on the Amiga, please join us in the main auditorium. <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll give it to Tony to take away. Thank you. Can you hear me, Bubba? Unmute yourself. You're muted. Oh, I'm muted? Button on the top. Button on the top. Button on the top three. Okay. It's great. Okay. Hi everybody. I'm going to tell you today about a little history of file systems over on the Amiga over the years. We'll start off with a discussion of the packet-based file systems from from ages ago, and we'll then introduce the idea of the vector port file systems which is the new generation which we are uh, working on for OS 4.2. Um, I'll then uh, briefly discuss how, to, how you go about writing one of these things and we'll talk about some examples like the new ENV handler which has been out there already since the final edition ISO was released. The RAM handler the same a fuse base, which is, uh, uh, and a couple of other examples. NGFS is a new file system, which, as Bill just told you, is being worked on at the moment and in beta. Okay. Here's a packet-based file system from the old 68K days. You had a Caller, prog caller program over here on the left hand side who is operating in his own green task context and he sends a message to the file system which is operating in its own red file context, uh, task context I should say, and that has to talk to the disk driver and the disk driver is operating in its task context as well. So every time you send a message from there to there or from there to there there's a task switch in the kernel. And it didn't matter too much in the days of 68K when you were operating on floppies because the speed of the I.O. device was much slower than everything else. But these days with uh, fast processors, fast memory, the <coughs> task switching becomes a considerable part of the overall um, overhead. This uh, packet-based system has some good points. Firstly, the server is asynchronous with the client. So uh, the client sends the message, the server can start uh, processing that message, writing stuff to disk, fetching stuff back again. The client can, in theory, go off and do other things and then come back and find out whether, whether its work has been done. Uh, this asynchronous um, ability was used, but it was there. Task switching, as I said, was relatively slow. And another problem is that the file, file system server must have access to the client's address space. That was never a problem in the old 68K days, or even as it stands today, because you're limited, everybody is limited to the lower two gigabytes of memory address space anyway. <coughs> the uh, t task switching is one of the major problems. And uh, when we started running OS4 and speeding things faster, it was said that a carrier pigeon could pass the messages faster. Of course, it would have to be uh, an African carrier pigeon rather than a European carrier pigeon. Uh, this one's mil spec, which should, which should uh, please our class owners. Okay, 
uh, amongst the classic Amiga file systems, we had the, the old file system, which, which was invented for use on floppies. Then when we got to um, hard disk drives, we invented the fast file system, so-called. The old file system was uh, made to be reliable on unreliable media like the floppies. You get a huge error rate off floppy disks. And the old file system had so much redundancy in it that you could recover from almost any um, um, Oh, what's the word? Intermittent error. <coughs> the fast file system did strip out a whole lot of the redundancy uh, so that, well, just to speed it up basically, but it's, it still has a lot of the recovery um, inherent in the design of the file system on disk. Then of course there were third party file systems like Smart File System, SFS0, SFS2, and later JXFS. And there was also the so-called professional file system. I must admit, I don't know anything about PFS except that a lot of people use it and swear by it. Uh, I haven't been able to find anything about it on the web, either, so I can't tell you anything. Some of these file systems varied in the lengths of names that, that they could support. They varied in the way that attributes like protection bits were uh, were saved and actioned. Um, in one case, for instance, the fast file system used to um, use the E bit on a directory as uh, giving you directory access. So you were you weren't able to read the directory unless the E bit was set or something like that. I forget what it was, but once again, that was different from the other file systems. Hard and soft links, most of them didn't do hard links. Only the fast file system and the old file system did hard links. And the way that a, uh, a change to a lower directory uh, updated all, the, all, all of its variants also varied. In the case of SFS, uh, for instance, and its brethren, a uh, change in a lower directory only updates the immediate parent. The uh, further up grandparents are not updated. <coughs> so, here is the new DOS vector port API. It's changed in that our client task over here on the left, the program that's running, now calls the file system here in the middle. The file system has a vector at the beginning with the addresses of all its service functions. This is exactly like a library. It's structured like a library and it runs like a library. It may have, but it's not a, a separate task over here which does additional work. In the case of NGFS, which I'll talk about later, this uh, separate task here does housekeeping and writing stuff to disk when necessary. Most of the work of the file system is involved in these independent functions which operate in and out of the cache. So the client talks to the cache directly with no task switching and he gets his answer back immediately. <coughs> so we've removed the need for task switching We've given the server access to the client's, the server here, access to the client's address space because there's no task switch. We've also specified the syntax and the semantics of the API here. It's all written down and specified. And if you write a file system, it will do this. It shall do this. Also, although it's not quite so obvious, there was a, a lot of overlap of responsibilities between DOS and the file system. <coughs> In the old days, had you were able to send a packet to the file system to, to for instance, take out a lock on uh, uh, DH1 slash kickstart 
uh, sorry, DS1 slash lib slash mui slash lib slash uh, thingowatsy dot class. And the file system had to be able to parse that string or any part of it uh, starting anywhere and find the file. These days it's all done by DOS. So the file system no longer has to parse arbitrary length paths. DOS starts at the root of the device and reads the, reads the root directory looking for the file. If it's not there, it reads the, the directory underneath. Directory underneath, directory underneath, until eventually we get a, a message, a call to the lock with a lock on the directory and the name of the file that you want, or uh, next directory, whatever it is. So it could not be simpler for the file system. So all these entry points now simply become what I call primitives of your input. They are, in most cases, a lot simpler than the old DOS packets. So they're faster and they have less overhead because the overhead is now moved into DOS and DOS operates the same Pre-packaging for all file systems. So, wrong one. Here is an example. Sorry, your vector port here is the array of of these entries telling DOS over here what um, primitives the file system can support. Here is an example of a vector port. I took this one from ENV Handler, but it could come from any of the others. It start, it, it's a structure which contains a few overhead in the top, like the size of the structure, and some um, ad addresses pass backwards and forwards between DOS and the file system. It then has a list of all the functions within the file system that the file system can has implemented. If there are any that it has not implemented, you stick a null in the list. In the case of ENV Handler, for instance, it doesn't do soft links or hard links, so those entries are nulled. That's all it looks like. It's just like a, uh, um, a vector table in a, in, in a library. So it's much simpler to implement now. <coughs> If you're going to write or port a new generation file system, these are some of the tools you will need. You'll need a specification first of all, because you don't want to get stuck into a long job unless you've got a specification at the beginning which you're not going to change. There is a program called FSV pool, uh, FSVP tool. Now this was written by Colin Wensley of the Aussie. He lives in Queensland, only about seven kilometres north. And uh, top of my phone together. Hi, Colin. Uh, Colin wrote all of the new API. He's also written this FSVP tool, which is a utility run, and it it generates a complete skeleton file system for you. It generates skeleton source files for every one of the primitives that you have to execute. It generates a, uh, an introductory start function which will get you in the air. If you run that and compile the result, you'll have a file system which runs. It might not do anything, but it'll run. And then all you have to do is is go into your cave for uh, six months and write all the individual primitive functions. You'll need a copy of the SDK, of course, but, but, but then you have one of that anyway. When you have your file system running, compilable and able to format a disk partition and write data to it, then you'll need to test it thoroughly. And FST, which is another, fun uh, another program written by Colin, FSTest uh, runs through all the 
all the primitives and the vector that each one does the right thing. You'll need plenty of time and plenty of coffee or tea. Now, <coughs> I mentioned Colin Wenzel, the birthday just yesterday. So, we all wish Colin a happy birthday. One, two, three. Happy birthday, Colin. Great. Okay, now some examples. Ian V. Handler. Ian V. Handler was the first one we wrote because it's so simple. The Ian V. Handler, of course, is just a cache, no more than a cache, for the Ian V. archive on the, on the system disk. So, Pref's Ian V. archive is read into the cache at system init in it time. It, it then rep, um, exposes a vector. We have a request coming in from an external task. It passes straight into the ENV handler file system and reads its data. They usually reads. We don't do much writing to ENV handler, but it can happen. And um, and the data is returned immediately without any recourse to disk. The handler does not write to, back to ENV archive at any time. It only reads, uh, which is how you, have, how you get the difference, of course, between use and save in a requester. Use only changes ENV handler, save changes ENV handler and the archive in the background. Next, the uh, RAM handler. <coughs> RAM handler is a little bit more interesting. RAM handler is a complete file system and it does everything but read or write from disk. So it supports every form of files, comments, hard links, soft links, everything. And th th this was the second of, of our, of our um, new generation um, experiments. Once again, the, the RAM handler has a vector, vector port which it exposes to the outside world. Requests come in via DOS and are written into the, or read from the, the cache. RAM handler also has this ability to use extended memory in the range of 2 gigabytes to 4 gigabytes, in, in the address range of two gigabytes to four gigabytes. It's a complete file system and of course as soon as anything goes wrong with one of with, with a version of my file system the first thing that anybody does any of the beta testers does is to go and check it in RAM see what RAM does. Uh, invariably RAM does the right thing and so I have to fix mine. It, it is the model for all other file system testing. You can give me a question now. I might not. I might ignore it. But fair enough. Also, what is the point of having a cache on a RAM disk? Because all the data is by definition stored in main memory anyway. The cache is the RAM disk. Oh, okay. All right. That's all. Okay. It, the uh, fuse interface. Now, this is a Linux um, aberration. Uh, and this is the way it works in Linux. In Linux, you will recall, all uh, device drivers and file systems and so on are built into the kernel as a, ma as a matter of course. So if you want to add uh, a file system to handle X2 or X4 or X5.5, you have to compile it into the kernel if it's not already there. The Fuse system, as I understand it, adds this uh, layer which runs in user space and you, in that extra layer you can plug in 
extra file systems as you wish. And you can unload them and load them at will. It's actually a combination because there's a piece to the front that says processor kernel, which hooks in like other kernel based file systems, and then that communication to use all this library based stuff. Yep, yep. <laughs> By the way, it's not just Linux, uh, it's also uh, all the BSD systems, uh, OS, uh, those all that things. Uh, sure, sure. So, this was implemented in Amiga DOS by Frederick Wickstrom, the Salasu, and he implemented this uh, vector port interface here, which he called File Sysbox. So it now gives us the same abilities as Fuse in in Linux. We can plug in an NTFS file system or, or any of the others which are available. Just fill it into the into the new system really well. The Aptor Aptor handler is a new one. I I think this is in final edition. I'm not sure. It's, it's a cache of um, paths for commonly called commands. So if you <coughs> in a command for, uh, type in a shell command for a strange, when I say strange, I mean it's something that's not on the system disk, something that might be on your program disk or wherever. If you t t type in the um, name of that, after remembers it, and so next time you type in the name, it'll go and look there first. If it's not there, then it'll go through the whole system path looking for it. So, the vector is here. And that was another one that Colin Wenzel did. Now, the next one is mine. This is a new generation file system. We decided that we had to have a replacement for fast file system, basically because it was slow and it needed to be updated. We originally intended to take the fast file system by rewriting its interface to the outside world. But Olaf Bartel said, look, don't worry about it, it's, it's too old. You'd be far better off writing a completely new file system. So this is what we, this is what we wrote down as a specification, something that had to be before we could think about releasing it. This was our specification, if you like. It supports journaling and any disk partition sizes. Object names up to 255 characters these days. Uh, that's file names or, or uh, link names, anything. We support UTF-8 2 in, a, in a, um, an early implementation of UTF-8. That's expanding as we speak hardly any limit to maximum file size or sizes or anything else. It uses virtual blocks on the disk. It defines, the file system defines a block size that it's going to use based on the size of your partition when you format the partition. So there's no need for you to choose a block size, but you can rule it if you wish. You can have comments of any length no limit to the number of objects in a directory. 32-bit attributes these days instead of 16. The right protection of the password, well, we had that before anyway. And it's bootable on the X1000 and later platforms. Unfortunately, not bootable on the SAMs or the, or the uh, XEs or the earlier machines. And there is already a separate command which you can for 
a comprehensive of the security of the file system and repairing it. This is the basic architecture of the file system, which should look fairly familiar to you now. Once again, we have a vector port interface to the outside world. We have a memory resident cache. We have a background task which does little more than write uh, dirty cache data back to disk. The cache can extract, can read data from disk in real time, but all its writes go back through the main program uh, when there's time to do them. The software modules in NGF I designed it so that it would be maintained. But one of these days I'm not going to be on this planet anymore and I want other people to be able to support it. So there's a bunch of files for the, for the root blocks, there's a bunch of files for looking after the bitmap, there's a bunch of files for doing this, that and, and the other. And they are all self-contained. So any developer ought to be able to go in there and say, right, I, I'm going to change the directory uh, I'm going to change the directory um, uh, structure on the disk. He only has to change those files. <coughs> Here's a look at the disk layout. The green box here represents the, the extent of the disk partition. So at the start of the partition, down here we have a signature block, just like FFS, and more or less the same format. It's just a series of ASCII strings describing this partition, um, how big it is, its start and end, addresses on the disk, its name, what file system it needs to run it, and that sort of thing. There's a root block at this end, and there's a, an identical copy of it at the other end here, so that if, if one gets screwed, you can still recover. In the middle of the disk are the fixed metadata, with the bitmap, which consists of a number of blocks, the journal, which consists of a number of blocks, and the root directory. It all starts from here, the root directory. As you add files and directories to the disk, they they expand outwards from the middle of the disk above and below. The, the directory structure, without going into too much detail, too much boring detail and putting you all to sleep, um, all objects on the, in a directory, you can have other directories, you can have files, hard links or soft links. Every one of these objects starts with a header block. The header block contains this block header structure at the top which describes what sort of object it is, its name and so on. In the case of a directory there are a number of slots underneath that to the end of the block. Number of 64-bit disk addresses um, pointing to the block headers of other objects within that directory. Once you run out of slots in this first uh, plain block header, you allocate an extension block header and, and you get a whole lot more. And they are chained in a, in a chain. There is, of course, an, an immediate caveat here. You say, but hang on, uh, how do you know what this other thing, what these other objects are. How long, how do you scan a, a directory? And the problem is at the moment that you have to go to the directory, read all these addresses one by one, and then find the block header, read the block of the, of the object. So you've got to read that and then that, uh, which does slow things down a bit. Here's the file structure. It looks similar except that the slots don't contain um, simply a 64-bit address of a target but 
but in the case of a file, a 64-bit address of a number of blocks of data on the disk and the actual number of blocks. So, so this is a file segment and you have a number of file segments in the block header. If they don't all fit in there, then you'll extend the block header to, to allocate more file segments. A soft link it looks exactly like a file, since that's all it is. Here's a soft link. No, it's not. Sorry, I'm changing the wrong one. Here's a soft link. It looks exactly like a file, because that's all it is. Uh, so you could have a soft link string which could be arbitrarily long. The why you want not know. Uh, hard links. Is there a path limitation? No. As far as there's no path limitation. So no. I could, because it's nested uh, in terms of block headers, I can have it. Yep. <coughs> hard links. As I mentioned before, not all file sy systems support hard links. I forget what they're called in Linux, are they? Well, the is, there are two ways of doing the garden links. You either use I know this or you use Garden Glitch. Yeah. This is Garden Glitch. Okay. <laughs> hard links. You have a next address and a previous address. These are actually within the block header. Yeah. So if you have an object that is a link, a hard link to a target. That target could be a file, a directory, another link, or anything else. So the next address here within the link points to the disk address of the target. Its next address is zero because it doesn't go any further. Its previous address points back to the block header there. You can add another one, or as many as you like, and they will be chained. So you've got link one, link two, da -da 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 -da, as far as you like until you get to the target. If you delete one of the earlier links, it's just a question of reconnecting the pointers. If you delete the target, then it becomes more interesting. What FFF in the old days was to take everything associated, all the, all the data associated with the target, copy it across, well, not, Copy it, transfer it across to the last link so that the last link became the target and the target was then deleted. So if this is a if this is a file here with say a megabyte of data in it with a whole lot of uh, file segments, all those file segments now become part of link two and the data is transferred there. If they're in different directories, as they could be quite easily, then you will find this target has dis disappeared from the target directory, but in the links directory, you'll find that link there is now no longer a link, it is a file. It is the file exactly the same as that one. Yeah. And it's all implemented with a few renames and a few, and a couple of moves, and that's all. It, it's a lot more difficult to, exp to describe it than it is to implement it. Is there a, uh, a flag for Denise uh, that understands this so far as on NGFS? Let's say I wanted to, I, I'm starting to begin it. I've got, I've got link 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and eventually 5. Here. Yes. If I delete link 1. Yes. You don't link the first link in your chain. Sorry, I was speaking up because other people won't be able to hear you. That's fine. So then. Link 2 would be the first start again. Yes. Yes. Is there a way to do the first place so that when I say the link, link 1, all the links and the target and the chain? No, there is no, there is no command that will do that at the moment. It would be fairly simple to write one. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, okay, here's the, uh, or I look at the case structure that. I've implemented in NGFS. The, <coughs> the case consists of a number of memory resident blocks holding disk data. These memory resident blocks are arranged into clusters of about 32 each. If a caller on the left 
wants to read a particular address. Let's say he wants to read address 103. That represents, if the clusters are 32 blocks, cluster number 3 on the disk and block number 7 within that cluster. So uh, the cache code will look in the search tree, in its search tree, to see if cluster number 3 actually is resident in memory. If it's not, it'll read it from the disk. If it is, it'll go straight to it and say, right, here's a pointer to block number seven, do with it as you will. So you then have an, a number of requests for um, new clusters, new, address, new disk addresses coming in, and each time uh, that, that a new one is requested, a new cluster will be allocated to to hold that disk address. What do you do when they're all when they're all used up? Well, you have to th throw away. There are many ways of doing this, and and the the LIU cache or the least recently used cache is by far the most popular. In this case, we use a variation of the LIU cache, the segmented least recently used cache, where we have a probationary list and main list, and these are lists of clusters, as we saw on the cache, adding a new cluster, existing clusters are used, it has to throw away one of the options. So, New clusters are to the top of the probationary list. Not accessed again, if they're only accessed at once. And are pushed down by new entries. Eventually old ones get pushed off the are returned. If a case a cluster address is written, Any old entries which fall off the top of the main list back to the top of the probationary list. So, again, it's, it's easier to uh, implement than it is to describe. But, but um, <coughs> what you have to then ask is what is the effect of uh, various block sizes and the number of blocks per, per cluster and I've spent, as you can imagine, a lot of time trying to optimise these, these values. One of the questions that people ask me all the time when installing this file system is what block size should I use? And, and uh, here is a graph of some experiments I did recently, only a few weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> along the bottom axis here of the graph are different block sizes and notice that it, it's a logarithmic uh, scale. The block size is multiplied by two each time. Amongst my tests I have one test which creates a whole lot of small files, all of equal size, and another test which simply a copy of a system image from one disk to another. And if you copy small files, uh, sorry, create small files on, on an empty disk, you'll find that if, they're only fi if you're only using 512 byte blocks, you get a sort of 2,200 per second. Uh, it goes up to a maximum of about 2,500, falls down to a minimum there of about 2,000 at 4096. But of course this is an 8 to 1 change here. So really over that 8 to 1 change in number, it, the speed isn't changing all that much. It's similar for a system copy. We're talking about a, uh, an OS4 installation with about 8,000 and 
and a, uh, a 250 really doesn't change that much with different blocks. What physical block size were the drives using? 512 byte. Because a lot of newer drives are coming out to larger blocks, but they'll sometimes make it look as if they have 512, but it's actually larger and matching your block size to the actual real physical block size. If the device driver tells me that this is a, a disk with 4,096 byte blocks, and I wish one did, <laughs> I'd love to test it. Typically, the drive doesn't tell you that. Yeah. I'd love to be able to test it. Theory, it should just work. <laughs> it's all there. But I haven't yet seen a drive that that uh, says, "Hey, I'm 4,096." Which works is that they sometimes actually offset that mapping because of the number of the that has 63 blocks in the first petition. Yep. Okay, once you've got your file system running, you need to do some testing on it. Firstly, compliance testing. You have to test the, that it obeys all the rules. And there are several tests that you can do, on, an infinite number of tests that you can do. The first one you'll need to do is this, which tests um, all the semantics of the vector port calls. It's fairly minimal. It will create a file, it'll rename it, it'll create a link to it, or this, that, and the other. On the testing, that is compliant with the specification. There's another test which was part of FFS. Size. Just for. It does another. of lots of files and lots of directories, renames them and, them and does all sorts of other things. So it's exercising the system a, a bit more than FS test is. It's still not exhaustive. None of the tests is exhaustive. I have a read-write test, which, which I wrote myself, which tests read-write operations on data files. Its uh, emphasis is on making sure that, that uh, read -write operations work over block boundaries, over partition, uh, to towards the end of the partition, in the middle, uh, and that all the boundary conditions work. Um, and then you have more real-life tests, like how, how long it takes to copy a system, or the SDK installation on a, on a volume, or anything else. <coughs> One test that you have to ensure here is that if you have a cache running and installed, to check that, that if you write to the cache, you, you can then reboot the system, bring it back up again, make sure that the, that the data you wrote to the cache was flushed to the disk and is there in the place that you thought it was. Okay, performance testing. There are lots of different tests as well. I use these half dozen here. The file create test, which I've already mentioned, it creates a given number of 2K byte files in a given directory. It's quite simple. It does, it does create, create, oh sorry, create, write, create, write, create, write. Um, file delete test, you can do that from the shell. Uh, system copy test, you can do that from the shell. System delete test, uh, delete star dot star, you can do that from the shell as well. And the same with the system read. You can copy the whole of your system partition to nil or to anywhere else and see how long it takes to read the system. Now, how, long, how fast these operations are going to take it depends, of course, on the state of your partition at the time. If you're going to do a, a file create like that of say 100,000 files and your disk is already half full then it's going to take it's going to give you a different number from 
if the disk is uh, new and formatted. If you have been if you have been using your sorry, I'm just on the wrong slide. If you have been viewing your collection of pigeon photos. Uh, shortly beforehand then you'll find your case is full of pictures like these and that's not going to be very helpful to your to your measurement. What happens if the, if the disk is half full? What does half full mean? Here's a disk partition and here's our fixed data in the middle and here's half, half used user data uh, reaching out from the middle, halfway uh, above and below. Is that going to give the same sort of uh, numbers as we, we use the first and the third quarters on each side? Well, obviously not. And, and the extreme example is, of course, when you have every second block already allocated. So, decide how you're going to specify the in conditions when you do these measurements. And my um, standard has been to start with the disk formatted and empty. More performance testers, tests, some of these can be more d difficult to, um, to put a number on. For instance, does the disk become fragmented and, and slow down operations after a time? I haven't noticed that, but I dare say it could. I, I don't know how I'd <laughs> go about measuring it if it did. Is all your data optimally distributed on the disk so that access time is minimised? I've certainly gone to a lot of trouble to keep the user data towards the middle of the disk so that it's no further away than from the fixed metadata than it needs to be. If you get formatting errors on the disk, like validation errors for instance, do they get worse with time or do they remain as a constant problem or are they covered up? Once again, almost impossible to measure. How long does it take to fully scan a disk in order to count its files and directories? This one is something you can do if you go to Workbench Info and, and hit uh, click in the box, it will read the whole disk and, and determine and you to get an answer. You can do that from the shell by typing list all to nil and see how long that takes as well. So, as I said, this file system has now been around for a while. <coughs> it's been beta test since February last year. And you how rest. I've compared it I, I have compared it with two others. The, the, the first is FFS. The second is a well known file system, which you will probably recognise. Um, I won't use its name because I don't want a direct comparison with it. This other one has been around for at least 20 years and is a lot more mature than NGFS is. Also, it's not a vector port file system, so the comparison is a bit unfair. Comparison tests I've done are all the tests which we've just been discussing. I did these tests on my standard test machine, which is a 460EX, uh, a system disk is 8,150 files, 800 directory, up to 50 megabytes total. A create file test now. This is what it does when you change the number of, or vary the number of files from 10. in a single our system appears to fall but from here to here is 10, 100, 1000 
3,000 times the number of files. So that's really not so bad. NGFS uh, does this up and down uh, chaos here. It's fairly flat. And FFS down here is on an entirely that uh, peaks at about 20 against 2,100 up here. The delete files test. We are deleting the files created in the previous test. Uh, here in GFS, for some reason, uh, gives us extreme, extreme high reading here. A, a small range of I can't explain that, and I don't intend to look, to look for it. It's just a funny thing. WKFS is pretty um, consistent over the whole range, and FS test, FFS is dead consistent at a steady 22. Did I skip one then? No. That's fine. The system write test. This is just copying one. Um, a system installation onto another, onto an empty partition, of course. Uh, NGFS and WKFS are more or less neck and neck here, and, and FFS is right back there. System read test, in this case I'm copying it from the destination partition to RAM. Here, yeah, for some reason, I, I don't understand, FFS is suddenly performing a lot better than on every other test. So obviously FFS is quite good at reading fast. Um, WKFS is stretch ahead, and NGFS is sort of in the middle. System delete test. So this is delete all quiet with chunk, and FFS is back here because it takes ages. WKFS is really good, and NGFS is about half the speed. The so system scan test. This is one that I'm trying to improve at the moment. Um, when you do, say, workbench info, and click on size, and wait until it counts all the files and directories, or uh, do it from shell, list or quiet to nil, and you can time that with the percent E um, prompt. And you can see that once again, WKFS is streets ahead. Uh, the NGFS is back here at at about 40% of that one, and FFS is not, not so far behind. So that's where we are at the moment. <coughs> so to sum up, NGFS is intended to be a replacement for the fast file system. It's not designed to compete yet anyway, with the more established file systems like SFS. It's a vector port file system. It's a modular software design so that people other than me can maintain it. It's been in beta test since February. Yeah. It's a work in progress and it's still being developed. And it will be released with OS 4.2. If you buy a, uh, an X5000, when the market, you will also get a, a, an early version of NGFS as a to play with. So that's it. Any questions? Uh, is it possible to turn off the uh, cache structures? No. It's inherent. It is. Originally, when I was getting the thing going, I, I, I made case optional, and I was doing all reads immediately and all writes immediately and so on, but we're past that. Is the file system, is it multi-thread safe? So different threads, different processors can modify the same node, <laughs> the same directory? Mm. Every... Um, access to the internal metadata which can change something is semaphore protected.
well, well they, they, it's just the one semaphore. So, in other words, everything is single threaded uh, once it gets into the metadata. So, yes, it's it's all protected. So there is a lot of mechanism to manage uh, these uh, the multi-thread access. Yeah. But at the moment, there's no provision for multi-threads at the same time. They're, they're all single-threaded. Okay, no more questions? Oh, sorry. Bill. I'm sorry, you'll have to speak up. No, I'm sorry, I still haven't heard it. Oh, right, yep. <coughs> um, it's, just a, it's just any other file system, so as far as media toolbox is concerned, it's just another thing that you select in the, um, the partition um, requester when you format a partition. You don't have to select a block size or any of the other advanced um, selections in media toolbox because the file system will select the block size for you depending on how big your partition is. The, there is uh, a command which I've written which does a comprehensive check of the, of the uh, structure of a partition. Um, goes, through, well, goes through everything basically. It goes through every directory, every file, every, uh, all, all, all the linkages, checks that the blocks which are allocated on the disk have been allocated and marked as allocated and all that sort of thing. And, and, and that uh, comprehensive test can also effect repairs when necessary. Did your question? Yes. Okay. No more? Okay. I declare this presentation finished. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eldie. <laughs>